please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Petra Sorcevicius. I'm an elected uh, member to the European Parliament uh, from Lithuania, Renew Europe. Today, I'm very glad I mean, to welcome all of you uh, on uh, our online uh, debate um, uh, with the laureates of the 2022 Nobel uh, uh, Prize for, uh, for Peace. Defending democracy and fighting for freedom. That's the title of our today's discussion. And we have uh, three representatives uh, uh, from uh, those uh, uh, physical person and two institutions uh, um, Belarus, Ukraine, Russia, those organizations and person who've been awarded this very high prize. Uh, let me to quote uh, a, a statement from the October 7th uh, from the Norwegian Nobel Committee. By awarding the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize for 2022 to Ales Belatsky Memorial and the Center for Civil Liberties. The Norwegian Nobel Committee wishes to honor three outstanding champions of human rights, democracy, and peaceful coexistence in the neighbor countries, Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine. Through their consistent efforts in favor of humanist values, anti-militarism, and principles of law, this year's laureates have revitalized and honored Alfred Nobel vision of peace, fraternity between nations, a vision most needed in the world today. Well, let me to ask um, an open question. What has happened in the area of Eastern Europe and Russia in the last 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, after the systematic political uh, reforms and transition from the totalitarian regime to the free market economy and, and democracy, why once again, after three decades, we are again speaking about this region as the region where democracy is to be established, where human rights to be uh, again um, valued, and territorial sovereignty guaranteed. All those three institutions, Memorial was established in 1987, Vesna in 1996, and Center for Civil Liberties in Ukraine 2007. I mean, each decade produced, I mean, those outstanding institutions now being awarded as a Nobel Prize of Peace. In fact, uh, 30 years, and still unsettled region of Eastern Europe and Russia. Well, I have a feeling that sometimes uh, it's evident that uh, Stalin's era is not over. The past did not give its way for future. So why and what happened and happening is in this region, why once again, we're speaking about uh, defending the democracy and fighting for freedom in Eastern Europe and Russia. And it is my great pleasure to have uh, outstanding uh, speakers uh, for our today's event, uh, which will be moderated by Edward Lucas, who himself is a, uh, is a champion for human rights and who knows uh, Eastern uh, European region, vast region, very, very well. Edward, I invite you, I mean, to start moderation. I'm looking forward for our great event. Thank you. Well, thank you, um, Petrus, for organizing this and for everything that you have done in the um, difficult months and years um, leading, leading up to this event. We really appreciate Lithuanian uh, leadership on this and you have the ability in Lithuania sometimes to think big when other countries are thinking small and uh, it's, it's greatly appreciated. Um, it's a huge honor to chair this event and to share a platform with um, Alexandra uh, Madvichuk, Alexei Kolchin and Sergei Davidis. Um, and we'll be hearing from them all in due course. I don't want to take up too much time at the beginning, but I would just say that I feel the spirit of 1863 
is very much in the room with us. And if we could have another panelist, perhaps you should be called Kalinowski, um, because the um, the memories of that that um, era, that struggle, um, sadly unsuccessful struggle um, against Tsarist autocracy, which united Lithuanians, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Poles, and Russians um, against the um, feudal, brutal feudal regime of the of the Tsar. I think that um, inspiration is still with us today. Now, I know we have a few logistical um, difficulties, and I think Alexandra is on a train in um, Ukraine. Um, but um, Sergei um, Davidis is um, is with us, and Alexei Kolchin is with us. So I'm going to go to you first of all, Alexei, um, and if you could give us um, some thoughts about um, the situation in Belarus, any reflections you have on your prize, but most of all, suggestions for concrete action. The European Parliament has become a really powerful body in terms of the pressure it can put on the European Commission for action, um, the way it can champion human rights cases, put pressure on other governments. And we see, um, whether it's in Moscow or Beijing or elsewhere, that authoritarian regimes, and indeed all sorts of governments, are really taking the European Parliament seriously. So if there's a particular thing that you would like Petrus and his colleagues to do, now's a chance to say so. Over to you, Alex. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Edward. And thank you very much, the organizers, for inviting me to participate in this discussion. I think we have an interpreter. First of all, I would like to congratulate our colleagues uh, from Memorial and the Ukrainian Center for Civil Liberties uh, for getting the Nobel Prize of 2022. If we speak about the situation in Belarus, Can we have someone to in interpret this? I sorry, um, I see there is an interpreter. Petrus, do you know where our interpreter has got to? Yes, uh, uh, Edward. I mean, you have to switch on interpretation on. Uh, Yes. Ah, please select one, two, English three. Channel. This channel speaking. Do you copy, Mr. Lucas? Do you copy? I am sorry, Alexei. The interpreter was already on, so please continue. Thank you. So, speaking of the situation in Belarus, the situation in my home country, which developed in the last two years, me, as a human rights activist, I can describe it in one word, a disaster. There was a disastrous worsening of the situation with the human rights and uh, the inspiration that we could see in year 2020. The response of the Belarusian society clearly indicated the uh, view of the Belarusian people towards the government that seized power in Belarus. And all of that led to the harsh and the extremely repressive response to the society and uh, the Belarusian regime continues doing it. It continue, It start, started in 2020 and this has been continuing until today. In fact, in short, the regime is suppressing any activity, first of all, any civic activity, political activity, any activity which is independent of the authorities. And the other thing, the regime suppresses any type of any other thinking. So this regime is constantly moving to what we call totalitarianism. 
It is not uh, there yet, but this direction of movement is very clear. And the most horrible thing that is happening on this pathway is that uh, the authoritarian leader governing the country, governing Belarus, he has engaged our people, our country, into the war. This is the most difficult and the most disastrous outcome of uh, the 30 years of being in power of Alexander Lukashenko. In fact, this is like uh, setting the line. I don't think what can be worse than this. And I believe that uh, this is self-evidence uh, marking of these uh, so-called achievements of the regime in Belarus. Nevertheless, it is worthwhile mentioning that the Belarusian society, which is in fact oppositional to the Belarusian regime, is still there. And the fact that uh, the, the, uh, this society is silenced now, it does not mean that the people have changed uh, their opinions, that they are not ready to democracy or that they are not striving for democracy. Therefore, the decision of the Nobel Prize Committee is extremely important, not only because it marks uh, a very deserved uh, achievement of uh, the Nobel Prize winners, but uh, this also sets a very clear and oppositional way, or the way, uh, the way that is uh, it shows that, on the contrary to the pathway selected by the tyrants, that the optional pathway can be human rights, democracy. This is what shall and can revert us from the thing that we are seeing today. Because today we can see that the human rights are fully destroyed, uh, that uh, uh, any any optional thinking is not allowed, uh, and uh, there is a war. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, and depressing, but um, I think entirely realistic introduction to the situation in in Belarus. We. I think everyone on this call will be hoping that the victory for Ukraine against the Putinist aggression will be followed by a um, great impetus for the pro-democracy, pro-freedom movement in, in Belarus. It can't come soon enough. Um, so I'm going to go next to uh, Sergei uh, Davidis. Sergei, um, welcome to our seminar. Thank you for everything you do. I remember from my earliest years in um, Russia after 1991, how tremendously important uh, this um, activity of um, the memorial um, was in terms of historical memory. And um, I know there was uh, some controversy about um, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize being um, split between a Russian, a Belarusian and a Ukrainian. But leaving that aside, I can't think of any um, organization in Russia more worthy of international recognition for its work um, than yours. So please, Sergei, uh, go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gra grateful for the opportunity to speak today on behalf of the Human Rights Defense Center Memorial and uh, indirectly on behalf of the entire award winning memorial community. We highly appreciate the honor bestowed upon us and believe that the Russian human rights community, the Russian civil society that opposes the war of aggression has been recognized in the person of memorial. We can see that it's very important that this year the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to representatives of civil society of our three countries. The civil societies of Russia and Belarus resist dictatorship and war. The civil society of Ukraine against barbaric armed aggression and such a list of laureates confirms the idea which is especially important today. 
that people are divided not by state borders and not by the color of their passports, but by their actions. And those who share and fight for the values of freedom, human rights and democracy are on the same side. As you know, the two main organizations of Memorial, International Memorial and Memorial Human Rights Center, were illegally and, and, and unreasonably shut down by the Russian authorities. Now we see that liquidation of our organizations was one of the steps towards preparing for a full-scale war against Ukraine. But these were actions within the framework of the Russian Russia government's final efforts to prepare for full-fledged war, which can be attributed to the period beginning in 2020 yes. with the so-called institutional amendments. During this period, opposition structures capable of serving as cent centers of unity for dissenters were finally defeated. The imprisonment of Mr. Navalny and Mr. Pivovarov the recognition of Navalny structures as extremists were aimed precisely at this. New draconian laws, even more restricting freedom of assembly, freedom of association, and freedom of speech were adopted. At the time, these measures seemed excessive because Putin's regime was successfully controlling Russian society without them. But now their meaning is clear. The dictatorship needed additional tools to control society in times of war. But of course, these were only the final steps in preparing for war. In fact, the preparation, preparation of conditions and opportunities for war had been underway for many years of suppression of civil society and human rights and freedoms in Russia. All these years, we have been repeating human rights violations in particular country, in our country, in Russia, are not just a matter of moral, humanitarian or legal concern. It was quite a pragmatic issue of concern for our common future. As Andrei Sakharov said in his Nobel lecture, peace, progress, and human rights are inseparable. One is impossible without the other. The suppression of civil rights and repression inside Russia has become the foundation of Putin's regime external aggression. Unfortunately, the voice of Russian human rights defenders who drew attention to the increasing number and brutality of human rights violations was not sufficiently heard in the world even after the aggression became apparent in 2014. Today, in order to provide the rear for waging war, the Putin regime is forced to resort to further intensification of repression, both against opponents of the war and generally against dissenters, against civil society. More than 19,000 people were detained for publicly expressing their anti-war position. More than 300 people were prosecuted for this. More than 100 people were deprived of their liberty, more than 30 of them under new anti-war articles of criminal code. For the first time since 2009, the total number of political prisoners on the memorial, uh, memorial's no complete list exceeded 500 people. These numbers are yet another sign that despite all the efforts of the authorities, Russian civil society is alive and opposes the war, supports the struggle of the Ukrainian people. In this war, the Russian state is repeating the criminal practices that memorial documented in the two Chechen wars and then together with our Ukrainian colleagues in the, in the conflict zone in Eastern Ukraine, at the boundary line in Donbass. These are strikes on civilian objects, the use of indiscriminate weapons, torture, for, forced disappearances, filtration points and secret prisons, extrajudicial executions. All this we see today in Ukraine with horror and disgust. Unfortunately, all of our 30 years of work has been unable to prevent either this war of these crimes. The repressive machine of the state, which has monopolized all of the country's resources and 20 years of poisonous propaganda are paying off. But they only secure the passive consent of the majority of the population to the war, not their active support. This is every reason to expect that as Putin's army is defeated, the economic situation worsens and Russian casualties rise, the consent will gradually diminish. The memorial, despite the liquidation of our legal entities, continues to work in, in all areas in which it was engaged. We continue to work con connected with uh, restoration uh, and pre preservation of historical memory. We continue to collect, analyze, systematize, and communicate to the world information about Russian political prisoners and support for victims of political repression. The work in support of refugees and migrants, led by Svetlana Ganushkin, continues. It has now been seriously strengthened 
and is aimed primarily at helping Ukrainian refugees and displaced persons in Russia. In cooperation with Ukrainian and European colleagues, we are working on documentation of war crimes. Work continues in other areas of our activity. If we talk about recommendations, of course, the first and most important thing is to fully support Ukraine, which is fighting a heroic battle against the aggressor. It's important to maintain pressure on Putin's regime and to maintain a firm and principled stance to it. It's important that the European Union and more generally the community of democracies not succumb to blackmail and not yield in the key issues. On the other hand, Russia is not equal to Putin, and no one but Russians can make Russia a democratic country that stops being a threat to its neighbors. Therefore, it's important to support those Russians who fight for human rights, against war, against dictatorship, both inside and outside of Russia. It's important to find the balance between sanctions, which are important and necessary, and the harmful restrictions faced by refugees from the threats of the Russian dictatorship, NGOs and other public associations advocating for human rights in support of Ukraine and for democracy in Russia. This includes visa restrictions and restrictions on bank transfers and open accounts. Finding such a balance is not easy, but necessary. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Sergei. And for those of us fortunate to, enough to live in free countries, we can only imagine the difficulty um, that uh, Memorial experiences in trying to do this work in Russia, not only because of the, the general repression, but also because of the particular new repressive measures um, introduced regarding the, the war in Ukraine. Um, so we're now going to turn to um, Alexandra, who I think is not able to join us um, in person because she's, I think, still on a train with bad Wi-Fi. Um, but she and her team are gathering evidence to create an international tribunal for war crimes and to hold the perpetrators accountable. And so we are going to, I think, now to play a short video from Alexandra, and then we will go into the um, discussion. So please play the play the video. We have been documented war crimes for eight years. Since the time when Russia started this aggressive war against Ukraine. Since large-scale Russian invasion in February this year, we united several dozens of organizations, mostly regionals one, into Tribunal for Putin initiative. We have an ambitious goal to document each war crimes which committed in the each village, in each oblast of Ukraine. Working together, we for eight months of large-scale Russian invasion documented more 21,000 of war crimes. 21,000, it's a huge amount, but it's still a tip of iceberg. But it's provided us opportunity to see the general picture and to assert the following. Russia uses war crimes as the methods of warfare. Russia tried to break people resistance and occupy the country by tools which I call the immense pain of civilian population. Russian troops deliberately destroy residential buildings, schools, churches, hospitals. They intentionally attack evacuation corridors and humanitarian initiatives. We document murder, abduction, torture and rapes of civilians in the occupied territories. There is no legitimate purpose and military justification for such actions. There is no reason in forced people to go to the basement, told them to appoint eight volunteers, and no reason in shooting them. There is no reason to have fun firing to people from the tanks whose bodies lay scattered around the streets until the liberation of Kiev region. There is no reason to break in someone's house, killing the owner and rape his wife next to her child. 
there is no reason in shooting a 14 years old boy at the close range who just playing with the ball in the yard. There is no reason in doing this. Russians did these horrible things because they could. Because for decades, Russia enjoyed impunity. I will remind you that Russia for many years before the war started, persecuted journalists, human rights defenders and civil activists in the country. But international community marginalized human dimension and a lot of countries provided business as usual with Russia. Now we have a clear example that human rights has to be taken to account on the same level as economical reasons when we take political decisions. For decades, Russian troops enjoyed impunity when they committed war crimes in Chechnya, in Moldova, in Georgia, in Mali, in Syria, in Libya. They have never been punished for all these atrocities that they have done there. They avoid responsibility even for using chemical weapons against civilians in Syria. It's led to result when Russians start to believe that they can do whatever they wanted. So now we must break the circle of impunity, not only for Ukrainians, but for the other nations. And this is a very difficult question how to do it, because national legal system is overloaded with an extreme amount of crimes, but International Criminal Court will limit its investigation only to several select cases. So there is a question which I want to put on the table. Who will provide justice for the hundreds of thousands of victims of war crimes who will not be selected by the International Criminal Court? In order to find an answer to this question, we need to elaborate a complex justice strategy. How to strengthen the potential of the International Criminal Court? How to increase the capability of national legal system? How we can use the efforts of joint investigative team to document war crimes, not only in the, their own territories, but in Ukraine, where the crimes are committed, and how we have to invent an additional international mechanisms like international tribunal and hold Putin, Lukashenko and other war criminals accountable. Also, countries can use the mechanisms of universal jurisdictions to prosecute some concrete war perpetrators in some selected cases in their territory. We must find the answers to this question, because now we face with enormous amount of crimes, and the war turned people into the numbers. Well, thank you so much indeed, Alexandra. I hope maybe you are on the call, at least um, listening um, from your train, but that was a really powerful um, exposition of the extent of the um, crimes perpetrated against your country and also the weaknesses in the international legal framework. That we and I keep on recalling where we had Nuremberg trials after the Second World War. And there was a feeling there for all the imperfections of the Nuremberg process that some kind of justice um, had been done, at least by the standards of the time. And it's hard to imagine how we're going to get there now. And I also want to thank you very much, um, and also um, Sergei, um, for pointing out that this has such deep roots. It's one of the most frustrating things sitting here in London, is the idea that all this is very sudden. Suddenly everybody's gone crazy. You hear that again and again. And there's not many days of Putin. It actually goes back beyond that. It goes right back to the 1990s. And um, we were warned in the West by Estonians and Latvians and Lithuanians and Czechs and Slovaks and Russians and Ukrainians and Belarusians and also and many people warned us about the trajectory 
of aggression abroad and repression at home. Uh, those warnings were ignored and the people who delivered them were patronised and belittled until they didn't really understand Russia properly. And the result of that is that tens of thousands of people are dead, hundreds of thousands, millions of lives um, blighted and this enormous um, damage of a trillion dollar or more damage and um, no immediate sign that it's going to improve. So I want to come to you next, um, Sergei, and ask if you would like to um, respond to anything that um, Alexandra said in her video, um, as, um, the, the, both in terms of the extent of the crimes there, um, their roots within the way the Russian Federation is, is run and the possibility for redress, or indeed any other um, points you want to make in response to what Alexandra said. Uh, there is nothing to argue, obviously. Uh, Alexandra is absolutely right. Personal responsibility is a keystone of uh, international justice. And even uh, it's impossible to um, uh, prosecute uh, physically those who is responsible for war crimes and uh, for war aggression as a whole. It's important to investigate these crimes, to, uh, uh, if we are not able to bring them to uh, court hall, uh, any way to deliver the sentences and uh, uh, have a united international position towards those uh, who, who are responsible for these crimes. Uh, and it will be useful not only for the world, for international security, but for Russia itself, for sure. Thank you for that. And um, Alexei, um, if you were able to, to hear that, I'd be very grateful for any thoughts you have on what Sergei and Alexandra said. And I might also just add a question about how you feel the mood is in Belarus, that if Lukashenko is pushed by Putin into giving ex you know, real military support for the attack on Ukraine. Um, how dangerous would that be for the Lukashenko regime? Could that actually prompt um, either a split in the regime or an uprising against it? I'd be very interested in, in your thoughts on that. Uh, Alexei, yeah. Yeah. I can probably echo what has been said by my colleagues. I cannot say that I can add much more. And all crimes have to be documented. They have to be judged. And the prosecutors have to be brought to justice and made liable. Because otherwise, this will break uh, the whole canvas of the society. Now, speaking about uh, your question, uh, whether whether Lukashenko is going to bring Belarus even deeper into the war, then I'm convinced uh, that the Belarusian people absolutely resist uh, the war they do not support the war in which the Belarusian people could take place. Anti-war sentiment is absolutely clear and visible. There is no support that Lukashenko is going to see if he brings uh, Belarus into military action. If Belarusian citizens take weapons, like if, if, if he thinks uh, that Belarusian citizens will take weapons and will go to Ukraine to kill Ukrainians, uh, this will not happen. There's a very clear sentiment in the society about that. And I believe that this holds uh, Lukashenko from expanding his uh, engagement in this aggression against Ukraine. And certainly it is evident that uh, the Russian regime is pushing him to it. Therefore, in this regard, I am optimistic about it. However, I believe that uh, in a 
uh, in uh, in a dead end uh, situation when the Belarusian regime is closely tied to the Russian regime, if there is no way out, he can also make some desperate steps and to do the things that all of us are afraid of. Nevertheless, I am convinced that this is very unlikely for this to happen and uh, he will risk his own power in this case. So there is simply no guarantee that people, once they have weapons, uh, they will not set the weapons at him himself. Yes, um, thank you for making that point. Um, it's a, a rare chance to feel pleased about something that Lukashenko is feeling scared. And I... Um, I wonder. I, I, I want to come back to Sergei next and ask a slightly related question, which is: There's been a lot of discussion, particularly in the Ukrainian press um, and online, about what this um, the the looming military defeat, because it does look as though Russia is not going to um, win, and it will um, have to settle for a, um, a you know, ultimately a painful. Um, outcome to the war. What this um, the, the the possibility of, of 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 defeat means for the future of the regime, but particularly for the future of the Russian Federation. And we notice that the conscription falls very heavily on the non-Russian um, republics, Buratia, Tuva, places like that, and that so the the pain of the war is not being borne equally across the Russian. Russian Federation. And some people have argued that this may be setting the stage for a new um, disintegration, uh, kind of 1991 all over again. And this raises very difficult questions, which we need to think about very carefully. One is, um, is that a good thing? What would the human rights consequences be? We saw the um, disintegration of Yugoslavia in the 90s with um, a very substantial number of people killed wounded and, and displaced. So I just wondered, Sergei, if you have any thoughts on what, um, assuming this war ends in some kind of defeat for Russia, um, what Russia will look like afterwards and what should we um, hope for and what should we fear? It's rather difficult to foresee uh, the exact scenario because uh, a lot depends on many uh, many events can, uh, which can happen or will not happen uh, and for sure um, uh, complete military defeat of Putin's uh, army uh, will make his position not so secure as it is. But we cannot say that uh, it will automatically uh, bring uh, to uh, overthrowing of Putin's regime is something new. And also we cannot say that it will immediately and automatically bring to the disintegration uh, of Russian Federation. Uh, we can foresee that the level of uh, public support of the authorities uh, and uh, even probably not of real support, but uh, of tolerance which we can uh, see now, uh, will sufficiently decrease uh, in case of uh, military defeat. And uh, unfortunately, our situation is that, that uh, Putin's regime controls all the resources of the country and is able to suppress any public movement. Uh, and uh, it uh, has uh, uh, undertaken a lot of measures to prevent possibility of any uh, centralized activity uh, directed against this regime. Uh, I uh, was speaking about it in the very beginning, and uh, uh, the state uh, is continuing to make efforts to suppress any uh, points of crystallization, to say so, not even political or civic movements, but uh, even religious movements independent from the state. So uh, uh, we can foresee that uh, if uh, after this defeat, uh, 
And if uh, this war uh, doesn't become nuclear, uh, we hope uh, 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 combination uh, of uh, public unrest and uh, some uh, split uh, in the upper level of the state uh, can bring to change. Uh, it's uh, the best uh, option, I would say. And then uh, it's possible to imagine disintegration of Russia uh, or uh, a new regime, but uh, I would not expect that exactly mentioned regions like Tuva or Buryatia are the first candidates to uh, become separate because actually uh, the burden of mobilization is uh, higher in these regions because uh, there is no uh, protest against them. In Dagestan, for example, there, were rather, uh, there was rather high level of protest against mobilization and uh, the level of mobilization was decreased. Uh, actually, uh, the state uh, mobilizes those who is ready to be mobilized, at, uh, who is, do not resist uh, this level of mobilization. So uh, the most depressive regions uh, where there is the weakest civil society structures uh, are subjected to uh, the highest level of mobilization. But uh, anyway, uh, there is some probability of uh, the combination of these factors splits, uh, split in the elites and uh, uh, public unrest uh, coming from the new uh, strata, uh, from those who until now uh, has somehow supported this regime. It can change situation, but for sure it's very important to continue support to the structures of Russian civil society, because uh, without them we cannot expect that uh, even after this uh, coup d'etat or uh, this change, uh, the Russia will uh, begin be, begin moving to democracy. It's absolutely impossible that this regime is immediately replaced by a democratic regime. But at least uh, in order to get regime which will be directed to a uh, democratic path, it's important to support those forces inside Russia and outside Russia, I mean uh, in Russian di diaspora, uh, who has the same and uh, uh, have intention uh, to make Russia a democratic state. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that this point about the diaspora is particularly important. We have hundreds of thousands of Russians living abroad who at the moment don't really have a consolidated political or social or cultural identity. They're abroad because they don't like Putin. They want to live their lives. They're not sort of the opposition diaspora of the kind that we've seen um, in previous waves of emigration. And I think that there's a great opportunity there to, to, to work on um, influencing these people and trying to create the bedrock of a future Russian um, political consciousness um, that might um, play a very important role um, after the fall of Putin, which can't come soon enough. Um, well, I'm so sorry we didn't have um, Alexandra able to join us in person. Um, but I think we've, we, Alexei and Sergei have more than made up for this. And I'm sure if this was a, a physical meeting, I would ask everyone to join me in a warm round of applause. Um, we can't do that. But please, whatever you're doing for Ukraine, for Belarus and for democracy in Russia, please do it more. That's the best way of expressing your gratitude um, and appreciation for the work of these really brave people. Um, I want once again to thank um, Petrus um, Astolavichus um, and his colleagues for their work in keeping this at the forefront of our minds and also for the work that is done in, in Vilnius in reaching out to the Russian um, opposition and hosting Russians there. It's vital that we are not that the Putin narrative that the outside world is just essentially Russophobic. It's vital that that does not take, take hold. And just as in 1968, we honour the courage of the eight demonstrators who went on to Red Square to demonstrate against the Soviet-led invasion of Czechoslovakia, we should feel the same 
admiration and sympathy for people who take great risks um, to express what may well be a minority position, but is still a, um, a vitally important one against the war in uh, against Putin's war in Ukraine. So I'm going to stop now, and we are finishing a little bit earlier because we didn't have um, Alexandra to join us, but I'm going to hand over to Petrus. Um, Petrus, do you want to say some um, fi final words as the host of our meeting? Thank you, Edward. Thank you very much for uh, moderation and indeed a very interesting discussion, uh, although a bit short, but uh, so good. I mean, we we have had uh, uh, right now. You know, uh, Edward, I think uh, the events uh, we witnessed in, in this vast region are important uh, for a couple of reasons, at least. Uh, I noticed, I mean, uh, that uh, uh, after aw uh, awarding this uh, Nobel uh, Prize for Peace, uh, as especially Ukrainians uh, pronounce that, all right, I mean, we don't want I mean, to be again in the same basket. I mean, all of us, I mean, free countries and uh, being considered as one entity. And it is not. I mean, uh, those countries are very different. Um, only Ukraine is a free and uh, democratic country. I mean, others too are autocratic uh, at the best, uh, um, I, have to, uh, I have to admit. But as never before, I mean, the future of those free countries uh, is interconnected. Imagine, and I am sure it will, it will happen sooner or later. later. I mean, Ukraine's victory will uh, bring a huge uh, change uh, uh, within Russia. It will be a defeat, not just a military defeat, but uh, I'm sure the uh, political changes will follow uh, within the Russian political system as well as in society at large. And Belarus, Belarus is so dependent on uh, events uh, uh, now uh, going on in, uh, in, in Ukraine. It's the only way, I mean, to get rid of the uh, Lukashenko regime. So that's why we have to see uh, those interconnections and uh, interdependencies uh, uh, going on now in, uh, in the Eastern European region. But definitely, uh, the Ukrainian... Uh, uh, fight against uh, uh, Russian ag uh, aggressors is important because it's a kind of a deconstruction of uh, Putin's uh, narrative that uh, democracy, human rights, and rule of law are not applicable to Eastern Europeans. I mean, the, uh, the part of the, uh, Putin's lies was always as, uh, you know, I mean, those nations, uh, those countries need something in between. It's like a Ruski mirror under the certain uh, uh, different uh, principles um, and applications. So now we see absolutely different. I mean, even uh, seeing activities of uh, diasporas, you, uh, Edward, uh, completely right. I mean, we have to support uh, those diasporas as much as we can, prove that those nations see their future differently from, um, uh, from those narratives I mean, uh, I spoke about. So that's why I appreciate uh, our discussion on uh, uh, on democracy, on a fight for freedom. And as never before, probably, uh, as Edward was completely right, uh, the slogan from uh, 1863 uh, for uh, freedom, yours and ours, is, uh, uh, is as current as possible. So that's why, um, I mean, by uh, concluding our <clears throat> short uh, online debate, uh, I wish, I mean, to thank all of, uh, of the speakers uh, uh, Edward in particular, and uh, should I say, Živia Belarus, Slava Ukraine, i Svobodneva Rasia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.